This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The NBA draft is tonight, but the NBA made sure it was in the headlines last night as well, all throughout the night while I was asleep. So rude. So we're going to break down the Kristaps Porzingis trade by talking to Austin Swain for today, getting his initial feedback on that trade for the Celtics, Grizzlies, and Wizards. And then we'll talk some UFC in Jacksonville. And I'll close things out by talking NASCAR and Nashville all coming up here today on the show. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and number fire knock. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for Number Fire. Joined here, as mentioned by Austin Swain. Check him out on Twitter at aswain3. You can find his work over at numberfire.com. And Austin, the NBA is back. Uh, it was off for like a week or so, announcing its presence with authority last night. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I think that the NBA offseason is actually the unofficial fifth big sport. We have the big four sports today. The NBA offseason might be its own sport and adventure. But you do (laughs) UFC and you do NASCAR. So I feel like you've snubbed those sports from the from the fifth slot there. That's right. When it's you and I doing this show together, we can put NASCAR at five and nobody can can argue with us. It's it's the big two of UFC and NASCAR and no other sports matter. That's That's my opinion. You know, NBA can fight for third if it wants. But, like you know, it's it's the UFC and NASCAR show here. I thought you were bringing me on to laugh at me because the Clippers were part of the trade yesterday. Then they said, you know what? Get get the Clippers package out of here. I thought the Clippers were getting an insane deal. So that kind of made sense. And then we got this monster trade overnight while we were all sleeping. So you were not awake for this either. I, uh, I saw it just actually, as I was going to bed, I was like, Oh, that's nice. And then, then went over to go to bed. I had a couple hours behind you here in Denver. So I I woke up to, to push notifications. One being like nine hours before saying that, uh, the Przingis trade was off. And then there was one five hours before I woke up saying it was back on. And I was like, very confused. So it took like a lot of digging, going through different timelines, uh, just trying to figure it all out. We're going to piece together that trade for you here in a second. We'll talk yep. about the implications of that and then talk about some UFC and then NASCAR later on. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Also, do not forget that all these shows do go up on the FanDuel YouTube page as well and the FanDuel TV Plus apps. If you want to watch Covering the Spread, the video version, check it out on YouTube or on the FanDuel TV Plus app for Amazon Fire TVs, Apple TV, and Roku as well can get all these shows right over there. Let's start things off, Austin, by talking about that trade last night. If you missed the details of it, nor trying to piece things together post waking up, aka me, Kristaps Porzingis going to Boston uh, along with the 25th overall pick tonight in the 2024 first. Marcus Smart is going to Memphis. Tyus Jones, shout out Minnesota. Danilo Gallinari, Mike Muscala going to Washington along with the 35th pick for tonight. The movement in the betting markets here, the Celtics were 5-1. to one. They're now down to plus 460 at FanDuel Sportsbook. They are the favorites to win the NBA Finals next year. You got the Grizzlies going 26 to 1, 23 to 1. So, Austin, what's your initial takeaway from this trade here with Christophs Porzingis going to Boston? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I think it does start with the Celtics, just as it appears FanDuel Sportsbook went ahead and made the Celtics the favorites already. And you you almost kind of go down a rabbit hole of all the different things that Kristaps Porzingis, such a multi-talented, faceted, big, consistent outside knockdown shooter, can score in the post, can uh, protect the rim without sacrificing offense, which is such a rare skill uh, in the NBA these days. And he had a huge bounce back season with Washington where he was actually very healthy. Um, I, I think he had a freak knee injury for a little bit but other than that he was pretty healthy compared to seasons prior so this is a huge deal for boston and by the way they didn't really give up a lot of of their collective assets to do it because they were a little crowded in their backcourt as well couldn't really get malcolm brogdon very many minutes so they go ahead and deal marcus smart to memphis and i think people are in large saying that memphis lost this trade because they gave they gave up a couple first round picks they gave up tyus jones and then they only got marcus smart in return I see this as kind of they were forced into doing this because of the Dylan Brooks shenanigans. They, they, they're they not bringing Dylan Brooks back, so they needed that wing defensive presence. And now you have two former defensive player of the years, Marcus Smart, Jaron Jackson. Like, that is a nightmare to deal with. Uh, in the playoffs, in a playoff setting, and Smart is a much more consistent knockdown shooter than Dylan Brooks was. So they basically upgraded that spot. 
you could argue that they paid too much in picks, but these teams, at least Memphis and Boston, are so good that the picks are going to be pretty non-negotiable. So I think those two teams made out well. And, you know, Washington's on this quest to the bottom, which is exactly what you want in the NBA. You don't want to be stuck in the middle. You either want to get a guy like Victor Wembenyama by being bad enough. And um, that's the thing you have to remember with this trade for Washington is San Antonio bottomed out last year, gave away DeJounte Murray for pennies on the dollar. The reason why is so they can put themselves in position to get a star. So I like this trade for all three teams. I do believe Boston should be favored. I Boston was very close to winning the title this year. If they'd got through that game seven, then they would have hosted Denver for four games and who knows what would have happened. So um, I think it's a good morning to be a Celtics fan now that you ended up with Porzingis anyway. Now, plus 460 is a pretty short number. And mm -hmm. it's a long time until the NBA finals. There are a lot of other teams that could potentially be in contention. Do you think that number is fair? You said that they should be the favorites. Do you think that plus 460 fully accounts for that number? Yeah, I, I certainly do. I, I I would not bet this number personally because yeah. there are a lot of different paths Boston could take now. It would not stun me in the least. Boston could theoretically flip Jalen Brown to Portland tonight for the number three overall pick or whatever they'd want to do because now they've got money moving down the road of whether they want to extend Kristaps Porzingis to a large, closer to max size contract because they're not going to be able to keep him uh, Tatum and Jalen Brown. So the Boston, I don't think Boston is 100% set on stone of what they're doing right this second for the future. So I wouldn't bet the Celtics at plus 460 right this second. Yeah. But assuming those three stay on paper, that's what I'm looking at. I prefer Boston to Denver. I think Phoenix, I definitely need, we need to see what they do with the rest of this offseason because their roster is thin right now after that Bradley Beal trade. Um, and then also, we'll, you know, we'll see what the Lakers, we'll see what Milwaukee does. So this market still very much moving through free agency. And free agency is still to come. The NBA draft tonight. We may yep. see more dominoes fall there as well. So still a lot of a uh, lot left to be decided in the NBA. But Brandon or Austin does think that the Celtics deserve to be the favorites in the NBA for the NBA finals as of right now. Let's talk about the USC because we got a pretty fun card coming up this weekend. Oh, yeah. Austin, the main event is Ilya Tapuria taking on Josh Emmett. And right now, Tapuria is a pretty heavy favorite over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Money line there is minus 390. Josh Emmett is plus 280. What's your breakdown of this fight, Austin? Any value you see right now at FanDuel Sportsbook? So that there's a slippery slope that I can get into with UFC when I give advice to people looking to bet UFC for the first time. I'm showing value up to minus 550 here on Ilya Taporia. But there is one if there's one thing that I do not regularly do in a sport where limbs break often, it's pick up pennies in front of a bulldozer. That's what I would call laying here minus 350 with Taporia in the event of injury or something like that. And you might ask yourself, you know, why do we have such a lopsided main event? Theoretically, UFC main events are supposed to be the most competitive, high-profile fights here. But when you look at this matchup, Josh Emmett, he's just not projected to compete on the mat when grappling. That Ilya Taporia in his last fight goes and dominates a guy in Bryce Mitchell, the former boogeyman of this division grappling. Nobody saw that outcome. Taporia, by submission, um, was well over 10 to 1 in that fight. Taporia showed those skills, and then Emmett in his last fight was just submitted by a guy who is less potent in that specific element in Yair Rodriguez. Rodriguez is kind of a dynamic striker, more of a well-rounded guy, but Taporia is specifically a better grappler. And, you know, these are high-level fights, but when I look at Josh Emmett, he tore his knee in June of 2020, and then he's had long recovery come back. I don't think he's got the same gear, which is really sad. You know, we see this with athletes in a lot of other sports. Negative 73 striking differential in three fights since. Uh, his knockdown rate has dropped 0 0.60 percentage points. Um, he really needs a knockout punch in this fight, given all the danger he's going to face on the mat. He's not a particularly efficient striker, just a 37% striking accuracy. He needs the bomb, and I don't think he's got it. And that's why, why you see Taporia is such a heavy favorite here. Okay, so minus 390 is a number where you're showing value but not going to bet that. Are there any yeah. places you want to take advantage of the mismatch here, or do you think it's kind of just to stay away because the markets are fully encapsulating the lopsided nature of this one? So if I end up on a side in this fight, um, you also see that the round props under two and a half is, is juiced pretty significantly as well, expecting an early finish from Taporia. I would probably look at Taporia by submission for a method of victory. I It's at plus 150, or at least it was when I checked yesterday. 
I've got it closer to minus 110, given the canyon that I mentioned grappling. You talked about how Emmett in his last fight was submitted by a less potent grappler. Taboria, very aggressive. He actually leads the card in submission attempts for 15 minutes at 3.2. So he's not one of those guys that will kind of waffle around it. Taboria is very aggressive in that domain. Um, I just, it, the only path to failure for that would be if Taporia tries to prove his striking against a guy in Josh Emmett that's done and accomplished a lot in featherweight and maybe a little bit less dangerous, as I mentioned, uh, than perception. Okay, so if you were to dive into this match, it'd be on the Tapuria by submission, which is plus 160 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. But a lot of other fights on this card, Austin. When you look elsewhere on the card for Saturday, which bets are standing out to you, starting off with money lines over at FanDuel Sportsbook? So a couple of underdogs that I absolutely love this week. Um, it, the first one, a little bit shorter of a number, Jillian Robertson was sitting around plus 100. Uh, even money. She's on the prelim card. Uh, and she's actually the UFC record holder for early stoppages at women's flyweight. She's now competing at straw weight, 10 pounds lighter. So she's a lot larger than most of the girls in this weight class. She's going to have a four inch reach advantage here. Significant power advantages here. So I'm, I, I got laughed at this on, I laughed at for this on Twitter, but I'm projecting the best striking efficiency of her career. It's not something she's overly comfortable with, but when you have an advantage in reach, when you have an advantage in power, it's easier to get more comfortable. And I, I even if on the ground, this is a stalemate between Tabitha Ricci, a black belt, Jillian Robertson has a ton of submissions on her record. Ricci's best win to this point was over 40 year old Jessica Panay earlier this year. Whereas Jillian Robertson's been in there with, uh, title challengers at flyweight like Miranda Maverick, Tyga Santos. Uh, she's been in there with a bunch of other girls in that division. She had, And when you look at Tabitha Ricci, she had a negative 32 striking differential at distance to a fighter who went one in four in UFC. So she's got a lot to prove. Her level of competition hasn't been very strong. Robertson's has at flyweight. She's just now transitioning down to strawweight. She was dominant in her debut. And when skill is limited in a lower level fight like this, size matters. The savage Jillian Robertson, she's got more of it. I'd put her closer to minus 150 here. So I love the price that I'm getting. Okay, that is for Rachi versus Robertson on the prelims for Saturday. Robertson money line plus 102. That's the first one Austin likes. You mentioned there's a second money line. Sounds like that one is a dog as well. Who else do you like here for a Saturday's card? So, Jim, I'm going to guess that you have some people that like NFL football that tune into your show. How about this story for you? Up on the main card, Austin Lane, former Jacksonville Jaguars defensive end. He's actually the second highest drafted NFL player ever to debut in UFC. Um, I absolutely love him, this spot for him. He resides in Jacksonville still. This is UFC Jacksonville promoted to the main card earlier. I'm guessing it's not because they're expecting Austin Lane to get knocked out. And <laughs> Justin Toff has been around longer. He has more experience in UFC, but it's not exactly high level experience. His three wins have come over guys that are just five and seven against all others. He's got a negative 0.89 striking success rate, very poor 49% striking defense at heavyweight strike defense very important to heavyweight jim those are heavy punches coming back your way and his is not very good whereas you look at lane through two appearances on the contender series plus 2.36 striking success rate he's much more athletic he's still got that same exact body and frame that he had when he was playing in the nfl and it's just unbelievable athleticism and he showed more wrestling on the regional scene he is a better more well-rounded fighter assuming that he can take Tafa's mammoth punch and tough has got a lot of power but a minus 186 price tag or at least that's what it was yesterday um that was that's a long pay price to pay for power i will take skill with the former nfl player in austin lane yeah lane is plus 144 right now fanduel sports but i think the most interesting or com compelling thing here is not the fact that he was a former jags player but he fell he spells his name a-u-s-t-e-n <laughs> we have you on your tin austin yep. uh a-u-s-t-i-n we have austin cass on he is a-u-s-t-a-n i have not seen a-u-s-t-e-n and so I feel like we need to find a way to get Austin Lane on the show to hopefully complete the Austin triumvirate, because I guess you could do O-N or Y-N. Y-N is probably like a 2023 kind of thing. Right. But like there are a lot of different spellings. I feel like we need to add an E to the profile here, too. T-O-N Austin Matthews, Toronto Maple Leaf star. So I don't think he'll come on our podcast. He's probably. No, I don't think he'll us. come on. Either. You know, that I might be too aspirational. <laughs> Um, yeah. Let me see here. Are there any, if I type into Google A-U-S-T-Y-N, Austin Gillette or Austin Weiner, Weiner, um, looks like they may be a, 
they're uh, an architect. So we'll work on it. We'll get the why. We'll try to complete everything here. So we'll work on that. But the money lines Austin likes more important than spellings of names. He like Austin <laughs> Lane plus one forty four and Jillian Robertson at plus one or two as far as money lines. Any props stand out to you? These were just up this morning, so uh, yeah. not a ton of turn of turnaround time there. But anything you like uh, right now, Fanduel? So we got props at least on the main card in the featured prelim. So the big fights, we still got some props on FanDuel Sportsbook here on Thursday morning. Uh, I am looking to the main card with a Brendan Allen taking on Bruno Silva. And Brendan Allen's a pretty sizable favorite in this fight. And you don't often see a exact method of victory as, as short as plus 175 in a fight this close. But Brendan Allen by submission, I don't hate laying this price even though it is pretty low. It's closer to minus 105 for me. When you look Allen in consecutive fights, now has already become the first person in UFC to submit Chris Jotko and Andre Muniz. Muniz is a guy that is a world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner. Okay, he won championships worldwide and Brendan Allen submitted him. It was a giant shock. You talk about north of 20 to 1. Nobody saw him winning that fight that particular way. Whereas Bruno Silva on the other side here, he's already been submitted in UFC by someone else, uh, Gerald Mearshart, and he now has six pro losses by submission to zero wins. And when I see that on a fighter's record, what that tells me, they're not comfortable grappling. And I think that could be the case with Silva, even when you look at how his UFC career has played out. A lot of favorable matchups against strikers. He's now got this shot toward the rankings, but Brendan Allen can do a little bit of both. Allen averages 1.60 submission attempts per 15 minutes. Not one of these ground guys that just happens to get lucky and, and go into one. He's aggressive, just like we talked about with Taporia. I don't know if Silva's grappling is up to a, a UFC ranked caliber level. When he was submitted by Mearshart, you look at the fight, he was very uncomfortable. Brendan Allen is a great submission practitioner. I think this price is short for very good reason. Okay, the number is plus 175 right now for Allen to win by submission. That is over at FanDuel Sportsbook for Brendan Allen versus Bruno Silva over on the main card. What are the props you liking for Saturday, Austin? Sure. And so um let's take it let's take a little bit of a dart plus 450 is a little bit longer of a dart here but i do like it the value that i get on it i'm looking at neil magny he's taking on phil Rowe in the featured prelim so this one uh will be right before it transitions over to abc and neil magny's a veteran been around the block a long long time maybe you're not even a diehard ufc fan you've heard neil magny because he's just been in big fights for a long long time and he's not really a potent finisher just a 40.7 percent pro finishing rate but that's kind of dinged by a long career in UFC. He's been fighting tougher guys. He didn't get a lot of easy matchups early in his career before he joined the promotion. I think this is a great matchup for him to find one here. So, Jim, if you scroll down, I'm looking at the double chance odds, which are essentially on FanDuel Sportsbook, how you access an inside-the-distance bet. I like Neil Magny by knockout or submission. If there's a disqualification, this bet would be void. Um, but I, I like him by knockout or submission, which is an inside the distance because I have Phil Rowe rated as his second easiest matchup in his last 19 fights. 19 is a long time in the UFC. <laughs> the only one lower was an aging Robbie Waller back in 2020. Phil Rowe's been fine at his level, but that level is not this ranked level that Magny's been fighting at. Phil Rowe's first two UFC wins have been cut. He lost by to, by decision to Gabe Green, who is one and three against everyone else in UFC. And then in his last fight, he had a negative 47 striking differential, but finds a miracle come from behind knockout of Nico Price. Not only is Magny more historically durable than Price, but he's also a lot better just in general. And Magny just submitted Daniel Rodriguez two fights ago. Phil Rowe has a 52% takedown defense, so you can get him on the ground. But I also wouldn't rule out, rule out just him overwhelming Phil Rowe in a striking match. There are levels to mixed martial arts. Neil Magny's been fighting top five guys recently if he's lost. Phil Rowe hasn't been anywhere close. So I see this as a wildly lopsided matchup. These guys kind of have similar frames, similar styles. So I think that's why UFC made this bout. But I love Neil Magny as a favorite here. And I love his inside the distance prop when he could be just a lot better. Yeah, and the double chance market, uh, Neil Magny by knockout or submission is plus 450 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. He's 35 years old, so a lot younger than I would have thought, honestly, based yeah. on the number of fights he's had. And when you've been watching him, it seems like to you, there hasn't been enough fall off to concern you at all. It seems like he's still chugging along well. No, so the you know the recent stoppages were to Gilbert Burns, top five guy, Shavkat Rachmanov, top five guy. A lot of welterweights in the world were taking yeah. those same losses. They've gotten everyone else. And the interesting thing here, Magny, with all that experience, is thirty five. Phil Rose, thirty two. 
with four UFC. So it's not a huge age gap. It's not this right. guy that is right in the smack dab middle of his prime. Phil Rowe's a little bit up there. So he's also not evolving as much between camps, typically veteran fighters. It's kind of like NASCAR drivers where you kind of hit this saturation point in evolving your talent. And then it's just how long your prime lasts from there. 30 to 39. I can tell you that uh, pretty Correct. exactly. But yes, uh, anyway, that's not related at all. But okay, so the bets Austin likes for UFC on Saturday. Jillian Robertson, money line plus 102. Austin Lane, money line plus 144. Brendan Allen by submission, plus 175. And Neil Magny by, or by knockout or submission at plus 450. Austin, I appreciate the time as always. Uh, enjoy the NBA draft tonight. Enjoy UFC on Saturday. I'm looking forward to talking to you once again here soon on the show. Sounds good, Jim. I'll see you soon. All right. Check out Austin on Twitter at aswain3. Find his work over at numberfire.com. We're going to talk some NASCAR at Nashville here in just one second. But first, baseball season is in full swing, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So don't miss your chance to snag a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager, only $10 deposit required. Refund issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Connecticut. 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9 with it. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. Or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's take a look here at the NASCAR Cup Series in Nashville for this weekend. And I'm not seeing a ton of value for the Cup Series for this weekend. I do show a bit of value in Denny Hamlin 7-1, but you can get better than that elsewhere. Plus 750 seems to be the most common number for Hamlin out there. I show value on that. And... I'm not itchy to take it right now. Uh, so for me, although I show value on Hamlin, not going to take that right now. I think I'd rather hold off until post-practice, post-qualifying, kind of see where things settle out there at the top of the board because you got a lot of guys like Kyle Larson, William Byron, who could potentially jump up and make that Hamlin bet look a lot less enticing than it is right now. The one I would be willing to take, depending on what number you can get, is Ryan Blaney. He is currently 9-1 to at FanDuel Sportsbook. He is 10-1 to elsewhere. I think that's the best I've seen as of right now. And I would take that if you can get Blaney longer than 9-1. to I've got Blaney at 11% to win. His implied odds at 10-1 to are 9.1%. The implied odds at um, plus 900 are 10%. So... If you force me to place a bet at FanDuel right now, it would be the Blaney outright at 9-1. to one. The reason why my model likes Blaney quite a bit is because he's run well at the tracks that I think are most relevant for diagnosing what to expect in Nashville. Nashville is a concrete track that is flat and intermediate. So do you want the concrete? Blaney was awesome in Dover. If you want the intermediate track, he was great in Gateway. He won Charlotte, which is also using the same package, and Dover and Gateway did as well. So he's checked a lot of key boxes. Uh, Blaney's always been fantastic in Bristol, which is another concrete track. So if you can get him longer than nine to one, I would take that right now. Even if you were to force me to, to bet a FanDuel right now, I would take Blaney over Hamlin. Blaney at nine to one, Hamlin seven to one. But I think the best value will come after practice. So for my betting guy later today on, on uh, number fire, I'll be talking about Blaney at nine to one. But I think, you know, I would shop around to see what you can get Blaney at. If it's 10 to 1, that's fine by me. But I think that overall being on Blaney is going to be the right way to lean for this race. As far as top 10 bets go, not seeing a whole lot right now over at FanDuel Sports. But closest one I got to is Chris Busher. Uh, Busher is plus 270, I believe. Yeah, 270 at FanDuel Sportsbook. 
I think I'm going to hold off on top tens until post practice too. So for right now, it's just Blaney uh, with the nine to one as being the best value. Again, shop around see if you can get ten to one. As far as the Xfinity series goes, I am very close to showing value in Justin Allgaier. He's plus 350 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Implied odds of that are 22.2%, whereas I've Allgaier 21.9%. So just a hair longer than uh, plus 350. So I can't get there personally. I'm not going to take a bad value. He is close, though. If you can get longer than plus 350, Allgaier destroys concrete. He won Nashville last year. He was runner up to Kyle Bush the year before that. So if you can get four to one on Allgaier, I would take that for sure. Haven't seen that as of right now. So to me, kind of a stay away in the outright market uh, for the Xfinity series. If I'm looking for bets in the Xfinity series, I would look at top five markets elsewhere. The t- three top five values I'm seeing are Austin Hill at plus 150, Chandler Smith at plus 350, and Daniel Hemrick at plus 750. Hill is a guy we've talked a lot about on the show this year. We've been on his top five markets several times. And Hill was okay here last year. He had a seventh place average running position in Nashville in 2022. So that's fine. But if you look at his form this year, it's been fantastic. Specifically, the one that helped me get over the hump a lot was Dover, where uh, Hill had a third place average running position there. So ran really well the entire race. That to me was encouraging, showing he can handle concrete. He also finished third in Bristol last year, another concrete track. The concrete numbers for Hill in the truck series were not as great, but he has improved as an overall driver a lot since then. So I have Hill at 48% for a top five. His implied odds at plus 150 are 40%. So I'll take that for sure. If you can get Hill at 12 to one or longer to win, I would also consider that. Uh, But the top five bet my preferred route for betting Austin Hill. Other ones as mentioned, Chandler Smith at plus 350 Smith. 29% for me versus 22% implied odds. He ran really well at Bristol when he was in the truck series. So um, that's a good concrete track. Dover, not as great for him, but also not terrible. So Smith has been great overall this year. I've been very impressed with him. Colleague, I think it's a bit underrated. I wind up uh, taking their top five bets pretty often. It's not been bad to me by any means. So I think Smith at plus 350 does make sense based on I think Cog being a bit underrated and the fact that Smith ran well at Bristol in the truck series. As far as his, his teammate, Daniel Hemrick, again, plus 750 for a top five. Um, Hemrick, I think his form is better than you'd think. He came out really fast in Charlotte, and I thought that he'd run well in that race, but had some issues pretty early on. I think that he was actually kind of live to win that race at one point early on. Really good car there in Charlotte. He's historically run well in both Bristol and Dover in the Xfinity series. We haven't seen Henrik be as good at Nashville, but thinking back to last year, Colling was in a massive rut at this point in the season, and I think they acknowledged it as being like a thing where they didn't have the parts to keep up. They picked up over the summer. They've been pretty good to open up this year. So I've got Henrik at 21% for a top five. His implied odds are 12%. I'm going to take that. So for the Xfinity Series, top five bets I like are Austin Hill, plus 150, Chandler Smith at plus 350, and Deanna Henrik at plus 750. As far as the truck series goes, I actually do show a tiny bit of value here on Grant Enfinger. He is currently plus 750 at FanDuel Sportsbook to win this race. The implied odds there are 11.8%. I have Enfinger at 12.7%. That's not enough for me to take it, especially because Enfinger doesn't tend to be super, super fast in practice. So might be able to get a better uh, a better number on him post-qualifying. So Enfinger is the first guy on my radar for a win. I do like Enfinger in top five. He's plus 120 there, whereas I'm at 50%. So for a top five bet, I prefer Enfinger over the outright, at least as of right now. The longer shot top fives are Chase Purdy at plus 650 and Jake Garcia at plus 750. And the reason why I'm on those guys is that there are no Xfinity or Cup Series drivers in this field because they're banned um, with this being a unique race for the truck series. So that opens up a lot of value for the regulars who may not typically compete to push for higher upside markets than what we typically be looking into them at. Uh, the outrides for Purdy, 40 to 1 for this race. Jake Garcia, 50 to 1. I do show value there, but I think the top five markets are the better ones for them. Both these guys are in really good equipment with Chase Purdy at Kyle Busch Motorsports. Garcia is with McAnally Hilgeman, so he's teammates with Christian Eckes, who has shown upside on intermediate tracks this year. 
Purdy finished fifth, fifth at Gateway. So we've seen him do it on an intermediate track already. And now again, potentially a thinner field. Garcia finished top 10 in Kansas, Vegas, and Gateway. And again, easier field here. I have both these guys at 20% for a top five. Uh, Purdy's implied odds are 15%. Garcia's implied odds are 13%. So it is a leap of faith because these guys are pretty inexperienced. They've not shown a ton of upside yet this year. And I think that for them, a top five is an upside market. So I'll take it. Uh, Purdy again is plus 650 for a top five. And we've got Garcia at uh, plus 750. I think both those good bets in addition to Grant Enfinger, who is plus 120 for a top five this week. So not seeing a lot of outrights uh, for right now, but hopefully things can open up after practice. We can dive in there instead. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Once again, a big thank you to Austin Swain for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on the Christoph Sporzingis trade, along with some USC for this weekend. Check out Austin on Twitter at aswain 3 and I believe there will be a podcast up for the DFS side of things uh, on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy podcast feed, talking about UFC as well. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Do not forget to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube or uh, the FanDuel TV Plus app. We appreciate those who have downloaded that already. And check us out alongside uh, Run It Back and Up and Adams, along with the solo shot as well. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you if you're betting the NBA draft. Enjoy that as well. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. Talk Pitching Ninja for some strikeout props. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.